Paul Borgart, please. Well, thank you. It's uh, really good to be here, and I want to thank the Sonic uh, X folks for bringing me here today, and for all of you for being here. Uh, now for something a little bit different than what we've heard before. Um, this is a book of uh, what we call creative nonfiction. It's a book of stories about nighttime and about how we're losing night, uh, we're losing real darkness. Uh, what are the costs? What are the, what are the consequences? Uh, and what can we do about it? Uh, we certainly can do something about it. Uh, I want to begin um, with uh, a photograph from uh, northern Minnesota, which is where I'm from in the States. It's uh, very near Canada. Uh, and when I was a child, this was the kind of night that we had there. We had natural night. We had real night. Uh, we had the Milky Way uh, above pine trees. Um, we also had uh, natural light like this. We had uh, the moonlight over the lakes. So this is the country that I came from. This is the country that I grew up with. Um, this is the night I knew as a child. And it's this regular first-hand experience of natural nights um, that I think, uh, well, people sometimes ask, you know, why did I write this book or where did the book come from? And I always point back to growing up with this experience. And you compare that to what I found when I was writing the book, the estimates now in the US and in Europe are that eight of 10 children will never live where they can see the Milky Way. So they will never live with this kind of sky. Uh, I've also had some once in a lifetime experiences with night and with the night sky. And I wanna read that uh, brief section for you um, from one such experience. Again, an experience that we're losing. The most beautiful starry night I've ever seen was more than 20 years ago when I was backpacking through Europe as an 18-year-old high school graduate. I had traveled south from Spain into Morocco and from there south to the Atlas Mountains at the edge of the Sahara to a place where nomadic tribes come in from the desert to barter and trade, a place that when I look on a map, I can no longer find. One night in a youth hostel that was more like a stable, I woke and walked out into a snowstorm. But it wasn't the snow I was used to in Minnesota or anywhere else I'd been. Standing bare chest to cool nights, wearing flip-flops and shorts, I let a storm of stars swirl around me. I remember no light pollution. I remember no lights. But I remember the light around me and the sense of being lit by starlight, that I could see the ground to which the stars seemed to be floating down. I saw the sky that night in three dimensions. The sky had depth, some stars seemingly close, some much farther away. The Milky Way so well defined, it had what astronomers call structure that sense of its twisting depths. I remember stars from one horizon to the other, stars stranger in their numbers than the wooden cart full of severed goat heads I'd seen that morning, making a night sky so plush, it still seems like a dream. So much was right about that night. It was a time of my life when I was every day experiencing something new. I felt open to everything, as though I were made of clay and the world was imprinting upon me its breathtaking beauty. Standing nearly naked under that Moroccan sky, skin against the air, the dark, the stars, the night pressed its impression and my lifelong connection was sealed. So again, I think it's this combination for me of uh, growing up in a place with real darkness, with real nights, and then these once in a lifetime experiences where I've seen what the universe has to offer. And I can tell you that, I mean, I wrote, I'm the guy who wrote the book, The End of Night. I went out looking for that stuff. It's really hard to find. Now you really have to go a long ways to find that kind of night. So why is that? Well, it is, of course, because of artificial light. 
this kind of blinding light. And I want to be quick to say that artificial light is not the problem. It's the way that we use artificial light. In fact, artificial light is miraculous, wonderful. We're going to have it, right? It's a question, though, of how do we use it? Right now, we tend to use it, we tend to overuse it and misuse it, which is, in effect, the definition of light pollution, the overuse and misuse of artificial lights. And what I'd like to see is that we use artificial lights intelligently, thoughtfully, responsively, and beautifully. Far too often we have lights where we don't need them, like in the middle of the woods, like this. We have lights that shine straight up into the sky, like this off billboards. We have lights that shine horizontally for miles and mile, miles, or in Europe for kilometers and kilometers, right? We saw this image a little bit earlier in John's piece. I love this image. I think in many ways it's quite beautiful, and it's a beautiful image of light in darkness, within the context of darkness, right? Light at night is beautiful because it's dark otherwise. It's in that context. Uh, and so I like to begin with that idea that this is, in some ways, a real beautiful image. Um, it is also a, an image of waste, however. The light that you see here is light that like those lights that I just showed you, either going straight up or horizontally. This is an image of light pollution. This is an image of light waste. The light you see here is not making anybody safer, for example, which is usually the excuse we hear that we need all this light to be safe. Light that goes straight up into the sky doesn't make anybody safer. Light pollution has three main elements. Uh, the first one is something we call glare. This is light that's, again, shining into the sky or horizontally, meaning into your eyes, making it hard for you to see. This is glare. Uh, this is something called light trespass. You see the property on the right there. The lights from that are shining across the street and bathing the house here on the right in light. Uh, this is actually a university where I taught for a little while. The students who live in the house on the right here have hung black curtains in their windows so that they can sleep. Do I have a, oh, I do. They've hung black curtains so that they can sleep at night to block the light out from the light that's trespassing from the other property. So glare, light trespass, and then third, we have sky glow, which is what you see uh, on the right. This is what you see over every major city in the world, especially on cloudy nights. Quite an interesting uh, comparison here. This is the exact same place. Uh, the only difference is on the left, there was a power outage. This is in 2003 in a suburb of Toronto in Canada. One of the people who live on the street walked down the street and took a picture of what the sky looks like when there's a power outage, and then later took a picture of what it usually looks like. Every city and town in the world has the same recipe for light pollution. Uh, this is the town where I live right now in Harrisonburg, Virginia, in the US. You can see the sky glow wiping out the stars there. A big part of that is the stadium lighting here on the left. We have street lighting shining in all directions. We have parking lots or car parks. Uh, far too often, parking lots like this are lit all night long regardless of if there's a car or anyone there. This is certainly true in the US. All night long, you see this kind of image. Uh, gas stations like this lit very, very brightly, far beyond the need of, again, any safety requirements. This has everything to do with getting you to stop and spend your money. They have figured out that uh, we love light and we'll be drawn to light and we're more likely to stop at the bright gas station than the dimmer gas station. In fact, in the last 20 years in the United States, gas stations and parking lots have grown by 10 times in brightness. So if we could jump back 20 years, it would be 10 times less bright. Las Vegas. <laughs> Uh, you see on the right, though, what I, I want to highlight here, electronic billboards. One of the things that's happening in lighting now, uh, all over the world, certainly in Amsterdam uh, and in lots of major cities, we're moving from electric light to electronic light. We're moving to LED lighting, essentially. Uh, this has both promise and peril. I'm, I can talk about that more. But these 
Very bright billboards are spreading all over electronic billboards. So let's go back to the, these are photographs, uh, satellite photographs, images uh, from space. Uh, we saw the one of the world before, the one of the US after that. Here's the one of, of Europe. The reason I want to show this to you is because uh, sometimes people will look at this and they'll say, well, sure, it's, you know, bright in um, up here, you know, in Amsterdam, Paris, Milan, Madrid. You can see the white splotches where the cities are. But once you get outside the city, isn't it dark again? Look, for an example, here, this sort of large area of northern Italy. It looks like it's a big valley of darkness. So, hey, light pollution's not that big a problem because it's really a city problem. And once you get out of the cities, it's, it's dark again. About 15 years ago, a couple of Italian astronomers wanted to show that, in fact, that's not the case, that light pollution, uh, our overuse and misuse of light, is not only a city problem, but it extends out into the country as well. So they took uh, their computers and color graphics and uh, all that mysterious stuff, and they made what they called the world atlas of the artificial night sky lighting. So it's essentially an atlas of the world at night showing light pollution, right? And here's this same image in, in their world atlas. So again, you can see the very white spots of the, the bright cities. But you can also see how in essentially Western Europe, there's no place you can go for back to natural darkness. You have to get out into the ocean before you get there. And in fact, there's that valley of what looked like darkness before. It's in fact, uh, the point is that it's darker than the cities. It's not as dark as it would be. Light pollution is affecting this whole area. Right. So I'm not saying that if you leave Amsterdam, you go out away from Amsterdam, it might be darker. Sure, it's darker, but it's not naturally dark. It's not as dark as it ought to be. I was recently in Colombia, and I added this slide from South America. You can see the Amazon still very dark, but anywhere there are people, there are cities, I guess I would say, uh, is a better way to put it. Uh, we have light. Here's an image of the U.S., Something to keep in mind, though, is that these images come from data that's almost 20 years old. Uh, it was from 1997, and things have definitely gotten worse, not better. One of the really interesting things they did was to take this data from 97 and estimate backwards and forwards to show us the trajectory of where we've come from and where we might be headed. So when we talk about the history of, of night and of lighting, in the next image, you'll see uh, kind of where we've come from. And they only go back to the 1950s. If they went back to the turn of the last century, you'd see something completely different. But here's that comparison. So you can see in the States where we've come from, the data they actually had in 97 and where they estimate we're headed. This is one way to visualize light pollution. Here's another way. This is something called uh, the Bortle scale. It's named after an astronomer named John Bortle. It's a nine-point scale, starting with nine being our brightest places. Pretty much any city in the world, any major city, down to one, which you see here. A couple things that always stand out to me about this uh, image. Um, in the U.S. and in Western Europe, most people live most of their lives in levels five and above. They rarely or never experience anything darker. And in fact, when I started the book, uh, I called a friend of mine who works for the National Park Service. They have, uh, in the US, they have something called the Night Sky Team. They go around uh, measuring levels of darkness in the park services, in the National Park, any park service area. And I said, hey, Chad, where can I go to experience a level one? And he laughed and he said, um, Australia would be a really great place to go. <laughs> And I said, uh, no, in the US. And he said, there's, I don't know, there might, there's probably not any place in the US you can go to experience a level one. So in fact, I spent some time with the Park Service uh, night sky guys in the book, and I went out with one of, the, uh, one of the guys to Death Valley, and I'll show you a couple images of that. And he told me that he's taken measurements in more than 200 places in the National Park Service system in the US. 200, 
and he's given three locations, uh, level one. So for the book, I borrowed that nine to one uh, structure. I start with chapter nine, I work my way down to chapter one. Uh, chapter nine, I start in Las Vegas, I start in Times Square. Chapter eight, I'm in London and Paris talking about the history of night and lighting. I just wanna highlight a couple of the other chapters. Chapter seven is a real important one and it comes very close to the front because it's all about that safety and security issue. I'll talk more about that in a second. Chapter six is the one maybe that gets the most attention. When you're talking about this issue, sometimes people say, oh, that's too bad, the astronomers can't see the stars, right? But light pollution isn't really that big a deal. Well, light pollution is a big deal for everybody. We could talk about the monetary cost, which is estimated to be over $100 billion a year worldwide. So we're wasting a huge amount of money a huge amount of energy. We have environmental costs that I'll talk about in just a second. And we have this, these physical human health costs as well. And I'll name three for you that scientists are particularly concerned about right now. The first one is that artificial light at night and light pollution, our overuse of that light, is disrupting our sleep and contributing to sleep disorders. Sleep disorders are tied to every major disease that we're dealing with in the civilized world right now, including diabetes, cancer, heart disease, obesity, depression. You're gonna hear more and more about how we need sleep and how a lack of sleep is contributing to ill health. Light pollution, artificial light at night is also disrupting our circadian rhythms, which uh, John and Noam and I know very intimately about right now, the disruption of circadian rhythms having flown overnight uh, to be here. Those circadian rhythms are the natural 24-hour rhythms that orchestrate our body's health. And when you, as one guy uh, told me, you know, it's like the circadian rhythms are like the conductor of the orchestra of all the different instruments in your body that keep you healthy. And when it's out of whack, the whole orchestra is out of whack. And then finally, and maybe most uh, concerning, is that exposure to artificial light at night disrupts the production of the hormone melatonin. In our, in our body, which is only produced in the dark. And a lack of melatonin in our bloodstream has been linked now to an increased risk for breast and prostate cancer. They found this especially, for example, in nurses uh, working the night shift, right? So that's just the physical health, not to mention the spiritual and uh, psychological health aspects. Chapter five is all about the environmental or ecological aspects of uh, light at night. And when you have a world that is so heavily nocturnal, we think about 60% of uh, insects are purely nocturnal. 30% um, of vertebrate species are purely nocturnal. And then so many other creatures are what we call crepuscular. That is, they're active, they're most active at dawn and dusk. They have evolved to depend on darkness. And sometimes people say, well, what's the research about this? And the research is very new. It's the research on wildlife, on, uh, on animals, insects, very new within the last 10 years. But if you think about the fact that life on Earth evolved, including humans, evolved with bright days, we certainly need light, but dark nights as well. And we start to screw, that, screw with that, we start to mess with that there's gonna cause all sorts of problems. Here's an example of what I'm talking about where you again have the light from the building here shining into the woods. None of those nocturnal or crepuscular creatures can live in this area anymore. It's essentially destroying that habitat. As I mentioned, I live in a town called Harrisonburg. It's a small city in uh, the state of Virginia in the US. It was recently ranked in the top 10 safest cities in the US. Uh, there is virtually no, what we fear most, uh, violent crime, crime from committed one person to another. And yet when I go to the local store, uh, the superstore, big box stores we call them, to uh, buy a light for my house, uh, this is what they tell me. They tell me to buy these lights to deter crime and keep my family safe. 
And unfortunately, the lights that they want me to buy are these kind of lights. They're unshielded lights. They're lights that are going to shine straight up into the sky or in all directions. So not only do I probably not need those lights to, keep my, to deter the non-existent crime and keep my family safe, but I'm also going to buy lights that contribute to light pollution. I want to show you two images that illustrate the point, too, that uh, Light at night, well, some light at night can help us be safer and more secure. More light, which is what we're seeing all the time, doesn't help us be increasingly safe. So two images back to back of the same scene. This first image is, uh, it's of a yard in Tucson, Arizona, in the southwest in the US. This is what we call a security light, or as some of my friends call it, an insecurity light. Uh, shining, we see these all over the U.S., um, shining in all directions. And imagine yourself as the photographer. That light is shining, it's lighting you up, right? The next image is the exact same scene. The only difference is that you or the photographer is going to hold uh, their hand up to block that light and thus mimic the idea of shielding our lights so they're not going into the sky or into our eyes they're only going downward. And when, you, when that happens, you can see the bad guy hiding in the shadows. <laughs> I'll go back to this one. You can see him there. If you look closely, he is there. Again, the effect is that you're all lit up. The light is lighting you up. He can see you. He can decide if he wants to attack you or whatever. But he's in the shadow. You can't see him because the light is blinding you and it's creating that shadow. So to actually improve our safety at night and cut light pollution, we shield our lights. Here's a, an example of, you can see here on the left, lights that are shining in all directions make it harder to see. You see best when you have the light shielded down. So again, it's not a question of light or no light. It's a question of how will we use light? Will we use it wastefully, irresponsibly, unintelligently, or will we use it thoughtfully, responsibly, right? We can do that with those stadium lights that I showed you earlier. They're very bright. We can shield them. There's more light actually on the fields. We can do that with street lights. When you do that with lights in the city, it creates, you can see all the way down the street because there's no lights sh shining in your eyes. So again, this idea that uh, light pollution doesn't help anybody and solving light pollution, controlling light pollution, not only saves money and energy, addresses the issues of human health and environmental factors, and actually increases our safety. Let me close with, though, a couple themes that uh, are paramount for me in the book, the first one being the theme of beauty. I, um, where does a book like this come from? It comes from uh, just always loving nighttime. I don't know how it happened, probably going back to uh, growing up in the place that I did. I learned to love night a long time ago. I always have. And I love the beauty of light at night. Like. Uh, Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament in London, or Paris, certainly, right? The City of Light. Um, such an interesting story in Paris. They've spent the last 30 years relighting the city to create the ambiance that we take for granted now and that we go to see. They spent 10 years alone relighting Notre Dame here. The, uh, I talked to the guy who uh, led the relighting of Notre Dame, and he told me that the priests let them do anything they wanted with Notre Dame, with the lighting, uh, except for two things. Uh, they wanted to light the rose window here at night, um, and they also wanted to create something they called a light bell, that uh, every hour on the hour there would be a strobe light that would go from the bell towers to the back of the cathedral, sort of echoing uh, a bell ringing. I hope this translates. And the priest said, uh, they said no to that. They said, um, this is a cathedral, not a disco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think light is so beautiful and so important to us. It's important to us to bring us together. It's important to us for romance, for intimacy. This is a shot from Santa Fe. But probably the most important light in the context of darkness is the natural light of the universe. And this is my favorite image uh, of my presentation. It shows the individual human here coming face to face with the universe. We have taken this experience, which was one of the most common human, of human experiences for all of human history, coming face to face. You walk out your door, and there it is. We have taken this experience and we've made it one of the most rare of human experiences, right? This just doesn't happen anymore for most people. And what are the costs of that? We've talked about monetary costs, physical health costs, environmental costs, but there are also, I think, huge costs that are more intangible to us, right? Spiritual cost, uh, the cost to our soul, the cost to our art, our artists, our writers, our filmmakers, our poets, uh, and maybe our painters. <laughs> Van Gogh is how we say it in the U.S. I know it's pronounced differently here. I haven't quite gotten it yet. I love this image, as we all of us do. There's the perception, though, that this image was painted by a crazy man. As one guy told me, uh, Joaquin Pissarro, who curated his work at uh, the MoMA, said, uh, describes Van Gogh, uh, people think Van Gogh was this werewolf of energy. Uh, well, Van Gogh had his issues, right? But he was also painting at a time when the artificial light, the extent of artificial lighting was gas lamps in people's houses. So he was dealing with a much different sky than we are today. In fact, a friend of mine who's an astronomer in Texas decided to imagine that he were Van Gogh today and what he would paint in this image. And here's his image of Van Gogh's Starry Night from now. In the book, I visit Arles, where Van Gogh painted uh, these uh, very famous paintings. I, I love this image as well. I don't know how many of you know this. I was, I'm delighted by this kind of fact. Uh, you can see the Big Dipper up in the top there, the Ursa Major. Um, astronomers have gone back in time, and well, they haven't gone back in time, but they've, they have, uh, they are able to go back and determine the sky the night Van Gogh was painting this, and they have found that the Big Dipper was actually behind him that night in the sky. So he just borrowed it, put it in his painting. Artistic license, right? I love that. You can go to the spot where he stood under the gas lamp to paint this painting in Arles, and so I did. Uh, waited until it got dark, went out there, was very excited to be on the spot. There's even a poster there that says, on this spot, Van Gogh painted this famous painting. Um, and here it is. So again, I think one thinks about how many young Van Goghs there are out there right now all over the world who are not being inspired to paint their version of Starry Nights, right? I'll close with two images, though, that a little more optimistic note. Um, this is a slightly blurry image because I took the photograph uh, of Death Valley in the U.S. in Nevada and California. Um, and I... I talk about this in the book. This was one of the most special nights I discovered. Um, you can see this in the, in the photograph a, a bit. The sensation of standing in the desert looking north and in the east, the stars rising out of, the, out of the ground and on the west, the stars falling off the edge of the earth. So you could actually feel the rotation of the universe was something I'll never forget. Uh, just a phenomenal, amazing experience. And yet, if you think back to that scale that I talked about earlier from nine to one, this would actually be a two on that scale, as amazing as it is, because you can see in the lower right-hand corner here the glow from Las Vegas. So even there, there's uh, an amazing 
Uh, in, on this amazing night, there's a little bit of a glow. I'll close with just a, a short uh, reading here from the book, um, and I want to say thank you again for being here, and thank you to um, the folks who brought me. Uh, to go along with this last reading, I'll sh this is an image of um, one of those places that my friend ranked uh, level one darkness. This is a place called the Racetrack in Death Valley. You, sh you can see the, the rocks make the tracks on the playa floor there. Um, these places still exist, so. Our sun is one star in a disc-shaped swarm of several hundred billion stars, writes astronomer Chet Ramo. That disc-shaped swarm is our Milky Way galaxy, and what arcs in three dimensions above this dark Nevada, dark Nevada desert is the outer arm of that spiral toward which we look from our inner galaxy location. Ramo continues, I have often constructed a model of the Milky Way galaxy on a classroom floor by pouring a box of salts into a pinwheel pattern. The demonstration is impressive, but the scale is wrong. If a grain of salt were to accurately represent a typical star, then the separate grains should be thousands of feet apart. A numerically and dimensionally precise model of the galaxy would require 10,000 boxes of salt scattered in a flat circle larger than the cross section of the Earth. This means that every star in our night sky, every individual star any human has ever seen with his or her naked eye is part of our galaxy and its several hundred billion stars. Outside our galaxy exist innumerable other galaxies. One recent estimate put the number at 500 billion. At some quick point, the size of the universe becomes overwhelming, its distances and numbers bending our brains as we try to comprehend the incomprehensible, that our night sky is but one tiny plot in a glowing garden too big to imagine. But of course, for all of human history, we have indeed imagined. Ancient civilizations from North America to Australia to South America and Europe created constellations not only from individual stars, but even from the black shapes made by the gas and dust that lie between Earth and our view of the Milky Way's smoke-like stream. And for ages, we imagined it might well be smoke, or steam, or even milk. Not until 1609 did Galileo's telescope confirm what he suspected, that the Milky Way's glow was the gathered light of countless stars. In these countless stars, in their clusters and colors and constellations, in the shooting showers of blazing dust and ice, we have always found beauty. And in this beauty, the overwhelming size of the universe has seemed less ominous, Earth's own beauty more incredible. If indeed the numbers and distances of the night sky are so large that they become nearly meaningless, then let us find the meaning under our feet. There is no other place to go. The night sky makes this clear. So let us go dark. Thank you.